most of the 50 persons and RF and micro system based systems. And also this is not RF and micro alone. So now you cannot uh, survive with RF and micro alone. So it is interdisciplinary. Definitely it is interdisciplinary. So RF and micro engineers should know in depth of the digital because simulation is the software, ABCD of the software, they should know. So, but it is not RF, it is interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. So, you should develop all the areas of uh, the science and then only you can become an uh, effective micro engineer. Then, about this chapter, anyway, all these dignitaries to uh, the person, in the person, so this is open. Definitely, I will uh, assure you, sir, this will be the, uh, one of the the biggest and contributing MDT chapter or the MDT chapter in RK we take in the worldwide because we are here to work for that. Definitely in near future we will be the outstanding chapter here. Definitely I know because those are here so they will be here to work for, for that. And this workshop definitely you should take all the good things of these workshops and interact with each and everyone. Interaction is very, very important because just listening to speakers, that they will give you a food for thought only. But interacting with all this, each other, communicating with each other, discussing with each other, the problems or small group and bigger groups, after going from this workshop also you should definitely interact. So things will come out from the interaction only, communication only, all the best and you are going to be in The future is our own. Thanks a lot. Prasun Chandran, Vice Chair, IEEE Student at IAST, to say a word. Thanks. Respected dignitaries on the dais and uh, professors and my dear friends, a warm good morning to all. So we have had three prosperous events this day. One is the joint inauguration of IEEE MTTS Kerala chapter and uh, IAST MTTS student branch. Also a one day workshop on IEEE MTTS workshop on microwave theory techniques and application. So we have here our director, Dr. VK Dadwal sir. So I would like to thank him for being here on this occasion. And our chief guest, Dr. Gautam Chathopadhyay from GPL NASA. And uh, Dr. SK Kaur, CARI IIT Delhi. I would like to thank them on behalf of IEEE student branch IAST and IST itself for being here. Thank you, sir. We have our keynote speakers, Dr. D.C. Pandey, DRDO, Professor J.Y. Siddiqui, IRP University of Calcutta, and Professor Ashik Po, IRP University of Calcutta. I would like to thank them on behalf of IEEE student branch and IAST for presenting on this day. We have Dr. Vaivyan Krishnamurthy sir, Registrar IAST and Professor Kudula Joseph sir, Dean Student Activities IAST. I would like to thank them for all the support and care they have been providing us for the student activities. Thank you sir. And we have the two leading roles of IEEE student branch IAST. Professor B.S. Manoj sir, who is the head of Avionics department as well as the counselor of student branch IEEE IAST and uh, Dr. Sinmoy Sahar sir, who is also the chair of uh, APS chapter Kerala, IEEE. So I would like to thank them for leading us and for all the support they have been providing us and for all the inspiration on our way. And thank you, sir. And we are uh, having a day because of these volunteers working all the day for making it a success. And we have to thank them also because without them, this won't be possible. So I would like to thank all the volunteers on and off the stage who has been working to make this event a success. So I would like to thank them. Then not, last but not least, all the participants here who has come here to get knowledge and I hope you will get a very contentful and resourceful day. And I would like to thank you all on behalf of IEEE Student Branch IIST and IAST. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Thank you. Now since this is a celebratory event, to make the mood a bit more upbeat, I invite the dignitaries for the cake cutting. Please. We have two cake.
CTS, one for the IGTS Eastern branch, and one for IGTS Kerala chapter. publications in international journals and conferences and holds more than 15 patents. He also received more than 35 NASA technical achievements and new technology innovation awards. He received the IEEE Region 6 Engineer of the Year Award in 2018, Distinguished Alumni Award from Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology India in 2017. He was the recipient of the Best Journal Paper Award in 2013 by IEEE Transactions on Gerard Science and Technology, Best Paper Award for Antenna Design and Applications at the European Antenna and Propagation Conference UCAP in 2017, and IET Professor Jason Winslow Memorial Award in 2014. So, with this, I uh, introduce the speaker and I uh, request requesting to take care of the rest of the proceedings. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning again and thank you all for coming. This is the first time for me here in Trivandrum. Uh, I have been to Kerala before and I like the food here absolutely. Great food. Uh, and I'm a Bengali, we love food. So, 
Before I start talking about all this stuff, I want to say a few things that uh, in the morning you heard from people that um, one of the problem is that electromagnetic is a very difficult subject. And the students, they don't want to learn about electromagnetics. You know that is an excuse for the people who cannot teach. Problem is with us, the teachers, we cannot teach well and then we hide behind the students say, oh, they don't want to learn. Why shouldn't the students go and work on software in here? You know that we heard that you know, people nowadays going and working the software and software don't need brilliant people, only RF and microwave need or antennas need. That is also kind of BS. If you get a good job in software, of course you are going to go and work in software. So it is our job to create good jobs for microwave engineers so that you will work in microwaves. So onus is on us, not on you. So if someone blames you for not studying microwave engineering, just tell them create jobs for you in work on it. That's most important. Okay? Another thing, Chingwa said that you know AP and MTT are kind of two sides of the same coin. Again, not true. Not at all. If you ask an antenna engineer, they will say antenna is the most important part of anything. Who cares what comes behind? That's what they say. If you go and talk to a microwave engineer, they will say, what is antenna? A piece of wire. Who cares? What we have the behind, that's most important. But at the end of the day, I work for NASA and we build systems for everything to work. We need antennas and also we need the back system. If they don't work together, we don't have a system working. So it is very important that antennas and MTT they will work together. So I'm very glad that we finally have MTTS chapter here. Because without that, your antenna is just a piece of wire. So having said that, let's start here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about you know different technologies that were developed in NASA. So one of the things that drives, so let me start with, I want to acknowledge my colleagues. The name of our group that I want is called Submillimeter Wave Advanced Technology Group, SWAT. And if you look at the faces of all the people in our my group, we have about you know, 24 people. So if you look at the faces, they're from all over the world. Then of course there's one Indian face here. Um, they are from all over the world. What makes NASA great is because we have people from all over the world. Diversity is one of the biggest advantages because we learn from each other. And that's what NASA provides. And you know we are successful because of that, not for anything else. Any, any organization, any institution is successful not because of the name of the institution, because of the people who are there. Like IIST here, you are all working here. You know, one of the key terms in IISD is the science. Because whatever you, you can develop the best technology in the world, but it is useless if it is not doing something for you, for us, human being. So that's why science, everything we do at NASA is actually driven by science. Any proposal I write won't be funded if there is no science behind it. What is so we start from there, what is the big science question we are trying to answer? And then comes what kind of measurements we need to do to answer that science question. The third thing comes, what kind of instruments you have to build to make that measurement? Then what are the components you need to build? So you can see that, you know, that's where the layers are of any big mission, any big instrument mission that we do. So, NASA has different centers. You know, I am here for Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Pasadena, California. This is the largest NASA laboratory for robotic missions. Missions to Mars. Non-manned mission. This, this lab, that's what we work on. Our headquarters is in Washington, D.C. You, most of you know about Houston, because that's where the manned missions are held. But we have, across the nation, we have a lot of different laboratories and they all expert are, they are expert in different areas. 
So before I start, I want to start with this. What you see here is the history of the universe. It's called the Big Bang Theory. This is not the Big Bang Theory you watch on TV. <laughs> this is the real Big Bang Theory. So we believe that our universe started with the Big Bang about 13.85 billion years ago. And then if you look at this, see we all are electrical engineers in a way, or antennas, or microwave. We are all, we deal with electromagnetics. So if you want to learn about our universe in electromagnetics, you can go back in time and you know, try to find out what happened, but we cannot go back beyond 400,000 years in electromagnetics because there are no electromagnetic radiations came out of this universe before 380,000 years. The first radiation that came out, the reason was that it was a big hot plasma and all the electromagnetics, they were you know, scattering inside in a way that no light came out. The first light that came out about 380,000 years after Big Bang is called cosmic microwave background radiation. And it was discovered by two scientists uh, Penzias and Wilson, Paul Wilson and Penzias. You know, there are two uh, scientists and engineers working for AKT Bell Labs, and they are doing some experiments. That was in 1968 time frame, and they are working in millimeter waves. Nowadays, a lot of people talk about millimeter waves is a big thing, right? It's so difficult. People are working in millimeter waves. People are working in millimeter waves in 1968, and they are doing some you know transmission experiments. And when they were doing the experiment, they found that in the receiver system, there's a little bit of extra noise. You know noise, right? When you measure your system, they could not explain what that noise is coming from. You know, when you are doing some experiment in your lab, and if you cannot explain something, what do you do? We say, must be experimental. That's what we do, right? And we make the error for slightly larger, larger, and say, oh, we are done. But they were smarter than I am at least. So they went and talked to a physics professor at Princeton. And that professor said, you must be measuring the first light of the universe. And they went back, they did some more experiment, and they wrote a paper. And for that, they got Nobel Prize in 1972. So next time, you do some experiment in your lab, and if you cannot explain the result, don't think it's experimental level. Might win the Nobel Prize, you never know. So, what we do in NASA is mostly driven by a big question, is, that is, are we alone in this universe? Is life exist only on planet R, or does it exist somewhere else? And that search is going on from the beginning. And we are trying to do, if you see that, if a lot of people ask me, what do I think? What do you think? Does life exist outside our planet R? Let's look, do some you know, thought experiment. In our galaxy, our galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, there are 100 billion stars. 100 billion stars for about 1 times 10 to the about 11. And we have about 100 billion galaxies in our universe which means there are about 10 to the power 22 to 10 to the power 23 number of stars in this universe. And we are finding that many of those stars, they have not only one, multiple planets, like our star Sun has how many planets? Eight. So many of them are multiple planets. So what is the probability that there is out there that one star around which there is one planet going around and conditions are such that life exists. It has to be finite. It cannot be zero, the probability. And that's what we are trying to find out. That's what we are trying to do by building instruments. Because what we do, we are engineers, best thing we can do is build something and detect. That's what we are trying to do. And you know that we keep going back to Mars. You know, the reason I put this picture here is because we, you know, NASA does lot of past missions. You saw me Mangalayan 1, now they're back in for Mangalayan 2 as well. The reason is Mars resembles very much like our own planet Earth in the early history of Mars. And a lot of them, a lot of unknowns. 
if I show you this picture and tell this is one of the roads in Sri Lanka during monsoon, <laughs> you might say, oh yeah, that's possible. Um, but no, actually this picture is from Mars. And look carefully, it looks so much like our own planet. And the reason I'm showing this is because we get this kind of terrain only when there is flowing water. If water flows, then, then only you get this kind of terrain, which means at some point of time on Mars, there's flowing water. If you go there today, we don't see flowing water. There is some water, you know, frozen water underneath the ground, but not flowing water like this. The question is, what happened? Where did the water go? And people ask, why do we spend hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars sending something to Mars? The reason is, can we learn something from here so that it does not happen to our own planet? Because if all the water goes away, that we won't survive. So that's why we're trying to learn from all this. And for that, we need to build instruments to learn. So we keep going to Mars. As I said, if you look at this, these are the different kind of rovers. You know, India is now uh, sending a rover uh, and a lander, lander is Vikram to move, not to Mars. Vikram and Pratyam is uh, two. So these are the rovers that we have sent to Mars. US is the only country where successfully landed a rover on another planet. No other country has been successful. It is not that they didn't try or it's not that they are not smart enough, they are not good enough, no such thing. It's because it's so difficult. That's why I'm really keeping my fingers crossed and praying that Chandrayaan will be successful. Even though moon is slightly easier, but still it is not easy to land something. I tell you what is the difficulty. Suppose you are playing, uh, landing on Mars, suppose you are playing basketball and you are holding your basket, the ball here. But the basket is not here. Basket is in New York. So you have to throw the ball from here so that it goes to the basket in New York without touching the rim. So that is the kind of difficulty we have to land something on Mars with an accuracy is about 50 kilometer diameter. That means we are not saying one centimeter accuracy that you have to land with within a centimeter of that area, no, 50 kilometers, even then it is so difficult. That's why no one you know, has been successfully landed on a Mars. So we did that in Pathfinder in 1996, look at the size, this is the real size, this is the administration building when you went that Cape here, so this is the real model. They spirit an opportunity, two of them, slightly bigger, 2003, Curiosity to 2011, they planned it's kind of a small lorry, some, and it gets more difficult. The heavier the payload is more difficult to land. Them. So we came up with new, new ideas, new ways. And to March 2020, the next mission that we're landing, the, uh, you know, we'll be launching next year. This is the advanced version of Curiosity. It has, that is, it has. You know, total cameras are 20 plus, engineering cameras, and then all the science cameras. So the lot of instruments. Where do I come in? I work in work on some of these Mars projects, but not in the launching or the landing part of it. After it land, what does it do? It has to do something. As I said at the beginning, we have to do science. The science return. So we have a lot of instruments in that. So I am part of designing some of the instruments, which gets the data and then we do science with that. There is a drill in this. So the drill, what it does is goes and finds a rock, drills a hole, and then takes the material out and try to find out what is that rock made of. Is there any fossil materials there? Is there any sign of life anywhere? So we do all kinds of stuff with this kind of instruments. I want to show this picture. So if you look at this, this is a picture, this is a picture of our planet R. If you actually expand, you can see Earth and the Moon. Why I show this? Because this picture was taken by Mars rover Curiosity from the surface of Mars. This is the first time 
a big capacity gain of our planet from the surface of another planet. It is really beautiful picture if you look at it. I show it to the students, there are a lot of students here. The reason I show it to the students is because sometimes we feel that we are very smart. We know everything. Right? And you know, I mean ego, too much of ego comes over to us that you know we are, we know all the stuff. But I want to show this picture because you know big scheme of things we are just a dot in the sky. So next time you feel that you know everything and all those kinds of feelings come over, you should think about this picture. Because from another planet we just look like a dot in the sky. Hopefully that will ground you and you all know that for electrical engineers grounding is very important. So okay. We, I said that there are about 100 billion stars in our galaxy. How many planets you have found so far? This is a plot of showing all the different kinds of planets we have found so far, about 4,000 planets. These are called exoplanets. We keep looking and trying to find new planets. So some of them are like our Earth size, majority of them gas giants like Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn. So when you are looking for a planet, we also look for something called planets in the habitable zone where life can exist, called Goldilocks. So what are those planets? To exist life, the kind of life that we know, because we are searching for the carbon-based life that we know, right? For that we need oxygen, we need water. So Goldilocks zone or habitable zones are the planets where the temperature is such so that water can exist in a liquid form on the surface. So that is the kind of planets that we look for. And we have found few of them there in the Goldilocks zone already. Then you might say that, you know, you said 100 billion stars, why 4,000 planets only? The reason is we haven't really looked too much. This is our own Milky Way galaxy. And look at it, we have looked only this part of this universe a small area. So we have just started, we have not looked further yet. Only looking in this area we have total found 4,000 planets. So if you look at all these galaxies and then 100 billion of them, we will find many many more planets and many of them maybe will be in the Goldilocks zone. How do you find this kind of planets? What kind of instrument you need to find? Right, that is the question because we are all, you know, we build detectors, we build instruments. One of the ways to do that is, if you look at this, if the planet is going around the star like this, then we can detect a planet. But if the planet is going around like this, because in our field of view, from where we are sitting, we cannot detect this planet. For this one, what we do is that we can measure very precisely what is the total amount of light that is coming from that star. But that is also not very easy. You have to isolate There's hundreds of stars there in your line of sight. You have to isolate this particular star, measure the total amount of light that is coming in, very precise way. And then as the planet goes in front of that star, light, amount of light that is coming in dips ever slightly. By measuring that dip, we will be able to tell that the planet and then, by measuring the time it takes to go in front of the star, we'll be able to tell what is the period of that planet. We'll be able to know a lot of things. We know also is that it, what is the density of that planet. Is there a rocky planet or is there a gaseous planet? Because we can measure the gravity, that is Uber. All kinds of stuff we can do to know. This, this kind of planets are actually sitting, you know, light years away. 40 light, 4 light years away. It takes 400, 4 million years to go there if you have to go by current technology. So we cannot really reach to these places. We have to learn from sitting here. So that's what we actually do. There's another way of doing that is actually called a Doppler effect. There's supposed to be a video that going goes around. A picture is part of play. So you can see here that as the planet goes 
in front of the star, you know, the, if you look at the frequency, because of the Doppler effect, the frequency ever slightly changes. And by measuring that, the Doppler, we can actually say that is a planet. So these are the two different techniques that we use for finding out if there is any planet. So okay, I mentioned that to have to look for life, we need water and oxygen. Is there water out there in this universe? Answer is yes. We found that when the stars are being formed, new stars, their water molecules are coming out at a very high velocity, 200,000 kilometers per you know, hour is the velocity of the water molecule. If you fire a bullet from an AK-47 rifle, the speed of the bullet is 2,500 kilometers per hour. So these water molecules are traveling that is faster than a bullet. So if something is traveling that fast, it starts to destroy. But the conditions are such that it will find a way to actually recombine and produce a lot of water. How much water? 100 million times more water than the total amount of water in Amazon River is being formed per second in one of these stars which means that this universe is actually flooded in water. So we have lots of water. So that's not a problem. That's good. And then, when we are talking about water, there's another issue is that, you know, when our Earth was formed, there's no water. Last evening, Chinmoy and others, they took us to Kovalam. And we we're sitting there, you know, sipping our coffee and looking at the water. And I was thinking exactly that so much of water, but actually when the earth was formed, there was no water. Then how did that water come from? Who brought water? Scientists believe <coughs> that earth water may have come from comets. The comets might have brought water. If I tell you that, then you say I don't believe you. How can you prove? Because as a scientist, as an engineer, we have to prove. Always we need to prove. When you make a statement, we cannot just say, uh, yeah, it happens both times. That is not going to happen. You have to actually prove. So how do you go about proving that? One of the ways we do that is it turns out that water has different colors. What do I mean by that is the water that you drink today is H to 16 O, the 16th isotope of oxygen. But there are other kinds of water, H to 17 O, H to 18 O, HDO one deuterium and D2O, we all know D2O is the heavy water that is used for nuclear plants. So there are different kinds of water and it turns out that different kinds of water has different spectroscopic signature in the sense that frequency associated with them is different. We all did spectroscopy in your high school, if you remember back. I did for some sodium lamp used to do and to see a light line that is coming up. So that's called spectroscopy, a particular frequency with them. So if you actually take the ratio of abundance of different kinds of water, it turns out that Earth's water, the ratio is matches with some of these comments, exactly the same. If the abundance of this ratio is the same, then it has the source has to be the same. It means it's coming from the same source. So that's why we think that Earth's water might have come from the comet. However, it's not 100% sure yet because we sometimes measure the ratio is different. So we are actually working on some instrumentation and talk a little bit about that in the next few slides about what can this future really to answer that question. Another thing I, I said that, okay, we are looking at those planets which are far off, they might take 40 light years to go there, but can life exist in our own solar system? This is a picture of Saturn moon Enceladus. Enceladus, what you can see that we actually built an instrument called Herschel Space Observatory that was actually I was involved in that. And there we found that water is gushing out from Enceladus. It's a cold planetary body. But water is coming out. What you see here is water. That means that there must be some set stored energy inside that is heating up that water. And that's why it's a liquid form, otherwise it's very cold. The question is, if there water coming up, what else is coming up from there? Can there be organic materials? Can there be life in that? So we are actually building, when NASA is planning a mission to go to Enceladus, 
and we are building instrument to find out what is coming out. Is there any organic materials or not? So it's very exciting time. Another area that is actually very exciting is called Europa. Europa is actually a moon of Jupiter. Again, it's a very old planet and it's all covered in thick ice, but scientists believe that there is a liquid water ocean underneath that. Liquid water ocean means that there has to be a mantle like our own art, which is heating up. And it turns out the thickness of this the, uh, ice is about 15 kilometers to 100 kilometers. NASA is planning a mission to go there in 2022-2023 to find out if there is any life in this water world. Suppose NASA comes to you, your own students here, and says, we are going to go to Europa to find out if there is life in that water world. What kind of instrument you are going to bring? What kind of instrument you are going to send there to find life? What will be your answer? That's what NASA did, right? NASA came to us and said, okay, then we are going to go there to find life. Bring something for us. So what kind of instrument you can build? Uh, methane sensor, it might not come out anything because you know this is covered with 100 kilometers of ice. Obvious answer will be, we send a drill, drill a hole, lower a bucket and see if there is any fish. I like fish after all. <laughs> so the problem there is that when you build, when you have this kind of mission, total amount of power that you have is about 300 watts, 3 light bulbs. That is the total power you have. What kind of drill you have with 300 watts that will drill 15, 15 kilometers of hole through ice? It's not going to work. So if that is not going to work, right? So now we have to think differently. It turns out that all this ice has some cracks. So what happened, the materials from here actually seeps all the way to the top. But it's so cold, the moment it gets to the top, it freezes. However, Jupiter is very close to Europa. And Jupiter has very high magnetic field. High magnetic field means very high radiation environment. So in that, what the radiation does, that it throws all the materials, this is sputtering, it throws all the material in the atmosphere then we are actually planning to build an orbiter that will go around Europa and we have high resolution spectrometers. So what we are going to do with the spectrometers is we are going to see if there is signature of organic materials. And in terms of our organics, they have spectroscopic signatures in the frequency band of 300 gigahertz to about 1.2 kHz. <coughs> so we are building instruments trying to see the organic materials. Organic materials does not necessarily mean life, but that is the, the prerequisite right, of the component's life that we know. That's what we are going to do. A lot of people ask me that, okay, you are looking for organic uh, the carbon-based life. Why not other kind of life? Because in other planets and other places, there could be life of other kinds. The question is how do you look for that? Because you don't know. So we always look for something that we know about, right? We know organic, the carbon-based life. Actually, Rabindranath Tagore, he wrote a beautiful poem and a, and a song after he met Einstein. This is about space and everything. And there, one of the lines, he said that Janar Majhe Ajanare Urechi Shanghar, which means that we are, I have such the unknown with what I know. That's what we always do. We search the unknown with our known knowledge. And that's why you can only search for, you know, our known kind of life. We might stumble upon unknown life, but you cannot really search for it. So that's one of the things that we do. Okay, so those are the science questions you are trying to answer, right? Now, to build instruments, we have to actually, we find that it takes seven years to go to Europa seven years and we don't have a lot of power available as I said. So we have to miniaturize everything. We have to make everything small. 
Now we are not really bad in making this model. But if you look at this, that this is the first IC that was built in 1968 at three to four grand scale. In 1969, after Intel actually came into picture, they made 256 bytes of SRAM, about 2,000 transistors. And now we know that it's the same size. We are making you know, all kinds of chips, which are 7 million, 8 million transistors. So we are getting really good at making complex systems on small chips. And we are actually producing about 10 to 19 transistors per year, 1,000 transistors per every end on our. I don't know why I put that statistics, but you know, that's OK. So, and most of them work. Most of these, you know, ICs, they work very well. Now, but only cheap is not going to be your instrument. You have to put things around it, right? When you actually do something in the lab, you know. And also, in that, you made a lot of progress. You can see this is 1917, the radio transmitter is so big. You know what this is? This is iPhone 5S, the entire circuit. Have you all opened your smartphone ever? No? You should open it. I opened my wife's. Oh. <laughs> it's it what that happens, that's right. Okay. So, you can buy a tool. You know, opening a, a smartphone is not easy. It's very difficult. Try doing that. But you can buy a tool with $10, a tool box, that you can open uh, the iPhone and uh, your, you know, whatever Samsung Galaxy, you should open it because it's a beautiful piece of instrumentation inside. If you look at these, if you look at them, there are so many chips, but all the connectors you have put together, the packaging that has happened. This is, you know, when engineers talk about piece of art, that's what we mean. You know, we mean that how the you know, workmanship has been done. So it's really beautiful. So we actually are trying to do the same thing for space instrumentation. Or this voice is also trying to do the same thing. That how can you make something highly complex but extremely compact? Low mass, low power. Because any space instrument, a, every gram of extra mass is a problem. It takes a lot more money to launch. So we are trying to do that. And one of the things NASA is doing, and you know your director mentioned also that about CubeSat. NASA is actually focusing a lot on CubeSat. CubeSats are shoebox sized satellites, very small, handheld, you know, one U stands for 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter, the small cube. How do you make an entire satellite in this small CubeSat? We find out that, we found that to make an effective CubeSat that can do some, some science for you, need at least 60. 6 U stands for 30 centimeter by 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter. Exactly like a shoebox. We need minimum of that because you know some of these takes in the house housekeeping, we need propulsion system, we need telecommunication system. This has to go and you know send the data back. So we are working on that, and you know that a lot of things that people have already built and are going around, and many of them are planned for future. So things that as your director said that you students are working here as well on CubeSat. That is really great. You can put things together and fly and do some science. And you know we have been doing a lot of CubeSat. In the first interplanetary CubeSat was Marco spacecraft because last year we landed um, an inside instrument on Mars. And then what is to happen when you send something to Mars? Because it takes signal for seven minutes to reach from Mars to here. And also, as it's going down, the robot or the instrument, we do not have a line of sight, direct line of sight, so we cannot really know what is going on until it landed on the surface. And so, to prevent that, what we have done is, as, as the inside spacecraft was going in, we launched two small CubeSat, six CubeSat, to provide communication. So, they have a UHF antenna here that talks to the uh, spacecraft, and you have experimented on that sent the data back to Reddit. And you will work beautifully. For inside mission, these two CubeSats actually provided us this communication. So CubeSats are useful. We are making more and more on that. So this is one of the features that we need for science. It's called RainCube. And RainCube is actually a radar instrument. 
if you look at here, okay, so now, so what it does is, as this cube site is flying and it has a deployable antenna of 50 centimeters, then it deploys and it does, we actually got very good data recently from this radar. The radar for measuring the clouds and eyes, and antennas for this one actually was designed uh, by my uh, postdoc Nasser Jahan. Nasser actually visited here. Some of you might well know him. So Nasser was my postdoc fellow, and then we hired him at JPL, and we worked together to make this antenna. It's a beautiful antenna. It's a 50 centimeter deployed K band at 35 gigahertz. It's not very easy to design this kind of antennas. And then, actually this is, I had a video after it launched, the rain tube, and from the spacecraft itself, when the antenna was, you know, deployed, the picture, but video is not working. You know, we can land something on Mars, but we cannot make PowerPoint work always. So that is one of our, <laughs> one of our problems. But anyway, so video is not working, but it, this, this one is working. So this is in the lab, it will show how you might have seen that before from NASA, perhaps, that uh, how yes, so how this is deployed. You can see the spring-loaded structure there, and then the reflector antenna. This is a mesh reflector that deploys. You can see this. Centimeter diameter, and there's some reflector there that has to deploy as well. It's deployed, there's a horn antenna there, basically, horn antenna is transmitting here, getting reflected back, and then the signal it goes out. So that's how we designed it, and it worked really well. The problem is that the scientists are very greedy. We made this 50 centimeter, it's like, wow, that's great. We made something that works 50 centimeter, they said, can you make one meter? So it is very challenging to actually make a one meter antenna that fits in a small volume because we are talking about cube sat. Doesn't have many much space. It has to all fold in, right? So but still, you know, we are very nice people, the engineers are always very nice. So we said, okay, why not? We tried. So we tried this with a one meter antenna. And we had to fold everything in a small, you know, 30 centimeter by 20 centimeter area. So if we can do that, we have to work. But anyway, I can stop. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, then I don't need Feed point. 
So we generate a surface wave that actually propagates into modular attack and is propagating on the surface and we do the modulation by this kind of structure. This is, I call it Fokin bed antenna. Fokin bed because these are metal pins. You know, Fakir is an Indian term of Indian saints who used to sleep on bed of nails. And then that's what I thought and I used that term. Now everyone is using that Fakir bed antenna. <laughs> People are calling it. Then, uh, you know, we, we made it about, this is 9 centimeter in diameter, but we are making much larger one. So idea with this is, think about it, you have the cube sand, and this is all metal. There is no dielectric in this. And it's extremely thin, one or two pages of thickness at the end. Then what will happen is, if you can paste it on the sidewall of the antenna itself, and just drill a hole, that is a circular hole, that is your feet. That's it. Then it works. So you don't have to have any complicated antenna structure. So that is the idea of this. And this is a band, as I said, is uh, you know 35 uh, gigahertz. We also made actually first we made it 300 gigahertz. Sure. So before making a 35 gigahertz, we actually made it 300 gigahertz. You know, 300 gigahertz is much more challenging than 35 gigahertz. So you can see here, and we made it slightly differently. Here the pins are all, uh, you know, uh, circular pins, and we modulated by changing the height of the pins. You can do different kind of modulation for the antenna. We could work on here. You know that if you make the pins like a elliptical structure by making orientation of the pins, you modulate the circuitry. And in this case, we have been modulated by height of the pins. At 300 gigahertz, we fabricated them with silica micro machining and then we put gold on them, spotted gold. This is the actual circuit and then the feed structure behind and what we need one. So idea is that you can see that this is a deep side. We want to put this kind of antennas, these metal surface antennas. to make one of the CubeSat to find out about the water problem, I said, to go to a comment, because we made only few measurements. So here, we, I am working on, and this is where I got about $3 million to build, to show in the lab that a CubeSat instrument that will eventually go to a comment and make this measurement. The name of the instrument I came up with actually in what are. WhatsApp stands for Water Hunting Advanced Terahertz Spectrometer and Ultra Small Platform. The, the reason I came up with WhatsApp is because we are trying to answer the question, what's up with water? Right? From where it came from. So this is the, you know, the rendition of these ideas that you know in a small cube size 6U will have antennas and all the terahertz instruments inside that in a two and a half U space. That means we need a lot of packaging, you know, a compact hub with that iPhone that you saw. We have to do that kind of structure. So this is a block diagram of that instrument because as I said, different lines and different frequencies. HDO is 509 gigahertz. You know, H2, 18O is 547 gigahertz. H2, 17O, 552. And the water that we drink is 557 gigahertz. They have all the frequency band. And so this antenna will receive all that and we have a calibration, you know, first thing is calibration. A lot of people who, you know, Naresh, Naresh is sitting here, he's a remote setting scientist and he was talking about calibration and standards um, when we were having breakfast. So calibration is very important and we need, have you heard of Dicky switch radiometer? It's kind of a switch we need for calibration. And then we have mixers and all the stuff that we do. And at the end of the day, the instrument has to be less than 2 kilograms of in mass and need less than 5 watts of power. 5 watts, a night lamp is 5 watts, right? So that's the total power you need to make an instrument that works. 
like this. So that is a lot of challenge. But we are actually made a lot of progress. This is the antenna. We are not using here the fakir bed antenna. Or because we have to find a way to make a 500 gigahertz per keyboard antenna. This is so we are using very low profile lens based antenna, which is a leaky wave structure. And the entire you know the thickness of this antenna is uh, less than six centimeters. If you think about it, a lens based antenna actually needs much much bigger structure. But we are going to do that with the innovation. So we have a patent on this. It works really well, and also we made some switch, as I said, for calibration. You know, low frequency, you make switch with pin dial. If you talk to someone, the pin dial switches are used, but at 500 gigahertz pin dial, they don't work. So we have to come up with the idea of making a switch. We did with MEN structure, with silicon micro machining. I'll show you how the MEN work. Is there's a video here? If you look at this, there is this. Rectangle, black rectangle that two wave guides looking down the particle. And this two arm that you see, they are armature. You know how in a wave guide, if you think about it, you know, you are doing your undergraduate or graduate studies, the cutoff frequency of your wave guide depends on what is the A dimension of the wave guide. If C is equal to C over 2A in the T10 mode, right? So if you put an armature arm inside the wave guide where it changes the A dimension, then it will change the cutoff means it can use a switch and that's what we are trying to do. I will show you the video that how we made the main structure. So you can see here that as arm, I just have to do it again. So you can see the arm moving in and out of the wave guide there and that's how we can actually make a switch. And that this is what can 500 meter extremely low loss. So we actually are making this kind of structure, and also we are doing CMOS. You know, this is a 90 gigahertz CMOS synthesizer. If you buy a synthesizer, how big they are? You know, K-band synthesizer in from Kisai is a box, huge box. You know how much power it draws? 20 watts of power. You cannot have 20 watts, but my instrument is 5 watts total. So we actually built a CMOS chip ourselves, designed it and built it at 90 gigahertz. And it worked very well. And we are also building all the backend spectrometer and all that works together. Now this is a picture, kind of, you know, it came in here, so it's not looking at great. But you can see here that this is the total instrument. This is the lens. And these are all these uh, components behind it. This is the synthesizer W band. And you can see this is a training, US training. So that tells you how big the entire instrument is. Very small, very compact. So we are now testing in the lab. And next couple of years, we'll be doing, you know, doing some pipe tests and everything. And then we go one day, hopefully, we go to a comet and make those measurements, water measurements, and we can confirm that water actually came, water or not came from comets. That's very exciting, think about it. So I have only okay, one or two minutes. What I do is I end with something else. I end with, you might have seen this, uh, Mars helicopter. So we have been going to Mars and all that. You know, Mars has a robot, the robot moves around. Robot is an autonomous vehicle, right? It drives himself and does all the experiments, send the data back. But then, it cannot really go far. So we thought, can we make a helicopter with a robot? That actually will be on the robot, it will take off from there, and you have some sensors, you'll go around, take some pictures, get some data, and send it back. And then the robot will decide, depending on that, where to go, where to find all those stuff. So, brilliant idea, right? Actually not so brilliant if you think about it, how do you implement it? Because when you have a helicopter on planet R, you have the blades going around. The rotation, the RPM of the blades are about 400 RPM, 400 revolutions per minute. But Mars atmosphere is one sixth of our atmosphere, so much lighter. So you cannot have enough lift. To get that lift, you need RPM about 2,600 to 3,000 RPM. <coughs> How do you make? something as a small structure that is going around that fast, 
it's not easy. And on top of that, we have to have antennas and everything on this small structure so that it works. We send the data back. And it, for the mechanical guy, they thought, oh, good, we'll make something very light. So made it very light for the material is like metal. If you have an antenna, that is a nice radiation pattern, and just put a metal reflector that is going around near it, what happens to your radiation pattern? Well, it gets messed up. So you'll have to, now we have to actually design what around to make sure that it works well. So I end with a video of the, you know, kind of, um, some animations, some real measurements of this helicopter working in our lab. There is sound that is not coming here. With that? Okay, just what we did. Let me do the sound. Because most of the video sound is more important. On, right? Sound. No, sound is not on. No, no, that's fine. Okay, now we will play without. fellowship. They give it to one person in each field 
electrical structure is one guy, physics one person like that. So David Gonzalez is he's from Spain, but he is PhD from Belgium. So he contacted me and he said that he wants to work with me and he actually applied for that fellowship and he got it. And he is brilliant electromagnetic person. So he came to me and we started thinking about doing some low profile antenna design. And then these are made for meta surfaces. So he had some meta surface uh, in the background and then we started thinking, okay, if we do something that like we generate most of the time, these are actually working on a surface wave. So most of the time, if you know that we actually avoid surface waves, because uh, surface waves are lossy waves. But in this case, we thought that if you can generate a surface wave on a meta surface and if you can modulate that surface wave as it is propagating, then that knowledge was there that they might radiate. The problem was how do you actually solve that in an electromagnetic solver if you cannot you cannot really put such a big structure on HFS and some CSP. So David spent a lot of time actually kind of uh, empirical and semi-analytical way to solve this problem. So first he could solve with the cylindrical that one of the reason we build the 300 gigahertz first with cylindrical because it's easier to solve it with cylindrical structures. So he did that and we again the fabrication is a challenge but we have fabrication facility, we have great engineers. We fabricated that and tested and then we were working on, you know, can we use the elliptical structure and then in the orientation of the ellipse that modulates the structure. So we can have everything same height but the orientation of that. So that's then it's kind of go back and forth, a lot of coffee drinking with a lot of friends and that's how we come up with ideas. I always say, I was telling others that all of you, all the students, and even the faculty and staff, you should go out and drink coffee together with your friends. Your friends not necessarily working in your area. Because that's where new ideas come. So I go for coffee every day at 3 o'clock with all my friends, one, some mechanical engineer, some electrical, so all different kinds of young people mostly, like you all. And we drink coffee, we talk about cricket, we talk about soccer, we talk about everything, solve the problem of the world, and sometimes about technology as well. And from those coffees, I have five patterns. Idea was that we discuss something, and someone came up with the idea, and I said, okay, why don't you solve this problem? I will pay for fabrication, someone else will measure it, we did, and something new came up. So that's why it's very important to talk to the friend who are not working in uranium because they can give you some insight. So that's how this thing came about. And your other question was about how you optimize. You know, what is the optimization process? process? Again, you know, optimization, you cannot do all this you know, electromagnetic software that easily because they can give you the result and analysis they can. Optimization, you have to actually develop sometimes your own course. That's why I bring way you go. You design your own code small structure to optimization and then go back. We, you need the tools, but sometimes you know develop your own tools as well. So that's what we do. Go back and forth. Any other question? I can see he's looking at me, so kind of worry. Just go over. So anything else? Last question. Oh, you all understood so well. <laughs> Thank you very much then. Thank you. Next time I should ask you to give me excess baggage fee because every time I come, <laughs> <laughs> my This is a new design uh, done by my students, which embeds the photograph of the school. <laughs>